Hi, everyone. It's a delight to be here again. And I'm pre-recording this session, so um, I'm going to have to visualize you all. Anyway, I I'm going to ask us to just spend a few moments uh, considering our situation. So, in other words, observe our minds. So just bring our attention in. Become aware of the mind. Then, with a few in and out breaths, allow any distraction, tension and so forth to leave with the out breath in the form of smoke, which rolls away and evaporates, leaving not a trace. Then, with the immediate in-breath, radiant light pours into the body and mind imbuing it with openness, calmness. Do this for a few cycles on our own. Then preparing the motivation for our session together. thinking that we're not doing it for our own purposes, but on behalf of all suffering mother sentient beings, starting with those who are closest to us, then reaching out to embrace more and more until not one being in the countless universes is untouched by our concern for their welfare. So feel that we're taking responsibility for them. We're doing this with a pure bodhicitta motivation, intent on becoming enlightened in order to be able to satisfactorily, completely fulfill their wishes faultlessly, without hesitation. This is in our capacity we must resolve to clarify the direction, the path leading to its accomplishment. So now visualize above the crown of our head about four finger widths above the actual crown, a multicolored lotus made of shimmering light. In its center is a radiant moon disk, a cushion, upon which is a radiant sun cushion. And upon this is seated our root guru in the form of Shakyamuni Buddha, in the classical form, the earth touching mudra holding the beating bowl. Again, the Buddha is made of radiant, pure light, enlightened energy. And at the Buddha's heart, we visualize Vajradhara. And at Vajradhara's heart, the syllable Hung, from which light radiates out into the countless directions, giving blessings to all sentient beings and also invoking all the blessings of the merit field, all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dukkhas and Dakinis, hearers, solitary realizers, Dharma protectors, Sangha, all the holy objects come back in the form of radiant light and absorb into our visualized root guru. So we'll keep the visualization there because we're going to do some more meditation later in the session. But this was really a special way of preparing our motivation in accordance with our topic, which is discussing Cab J's Oprah and Bichet's The Heart of the Path and uh, 
a magnificent and incredibly precious oral account of the entire meaning of guru devotion and uh the venerable elsa cameron has compiled this book uh, with incredible care and precision and drawn from many many different sources of Rinpoche's teachings over, over decades and so it's really the synthesis of Kab Jai Zopa Rinpoche's uh, wish to draw us towards a very clear and powerful understanding of the significance of guru devotion and I'm aware that the very word guru devotion, if we sort of mention it at, at, at a local restaurant to our, our non dharmic friends, sound can sound a little bit suspicious and a little bit wacky. So we have to uh, consider what how we approach this topic. And I was thinking to preface it by suggesting that our, our guru devotion, uh, the nature of our relationship with our teachers, is really something that's intensely personal it's intuitive and therefore it's something that we only share lightly i mean we don't share lightly we only share with care and and uh some sort of framing of the context of why we might be talking so i do know some students like to talk about oh my guru said this to me and amazing thing happened we might, da, da, da. they tell these incredible astonishing stories and then somehow you're meant to respond as a friend and, and it's very unclear how one might respond because the way in which a guru a, a virtuous teacher is manifesting to a particular student is, is very very particular and even over time that relationship can change in all sorts of very very uh, significant ways and so in other words we need to develop an internal clarity and resolve based on our own understanding and investigation and for that we rely on the classical sources and particularly the words of our own teachers to orientate us so i'm going to quote uh, a, a very very powerful passage from um kab jeso perumpishay's uh vajrasattva retreat commentary um for chapter 36 and it concerns Rinpoche's personal meeting uh, with Sir Kong Dorje Chang, who I mentioned uh, last week. Rinpoche, even though I had never received any initiations or oral transmissions of texts from beginning to end from Sir Kong Dorje Chang, I regard him as one of my gurus. Basically, that's what he is. When Lama Yeshi and I arrived in Nepal, we stayed outside Kathmandu at the Galuk Monastery in Bodhnat, near the precious great stupa. It was the only Galuka monastery at Bodha, and at the time might have been the only Tibetan monastery with monks. We stayed upstairs there for about a year. Every year during the fourth Tibetan month at Sakadawa, just been uh, in that time, they would do Nune. The year we were there, it was sponsored by a benefactor who had a connection with another Lama from Swayambhanat, Drobtob Rinpoche, not Sir Komdorji Chang. According to his devotion, the benefactor wanted Drobtob Rinpoche to give the ordination of the eight Mahayana precepts, but the Galuk monks weren't so interested in him. They wanted Sir Kung Dorje Chung because Drop Tuk Rinpoche practiced the most secret high griever deity that our Sarah J College practices, and they didn't. They thought it was a Nima deity or something like that. So for this kind of reason, there was some conflict. The monks prevailed, and Sir Kung Dorje Chung was invited to give the ordination of the eight Mahayana precepts in the early morning. So Rinpoche came in carrying the precepts texts, opened it and, and said, if your guru tells you to lick fresh hot kaka, get down on the ground immediately and lick it. Then he stretched out his tongue and made a slurping sound. He imitated a dog licking up excrement. This 
is how to practice dharma, he said. Then he left. That was his motivation for taking the precepts. But he didn't give an actual, but he didn't actually give the precepts. He just gave that advice and left. It was like an atomic explosion, a very powerful teaching. It really moved the mind. Just on the basis of that instruction, I took him as a guru. That's all he taught that morning. But he's someone who knows everything, a great yogi, as Sir Kong Senchab Rinpoche said. Sir Kong Dorje Chung would often circumambulate the precious stupa at Swayambhanat, the main holy original, um, original holy object in Kathmandu. To people who didn't know who he was or the qualities he embodied, he would appear as a very simple monk. They would think he knew nothing. A simple monk, mala in hand, circumambulating the stupa. That's how he appeared to ordinary people. He might have appeared like he knew nothing, but in reality, he knew everything. Sometimes he would be circumambulating with all the other people, and if the time was right, and if it was their lucky day, he would suddenly turn to a complete stranger and say, you don't have much longer to live, or you're going to die in a month. Better do prostrations to the 35 Buddhas. Something like that. Rinpoche would make predictions and advise the people what to do. But if the time wasn't right, if it was not the day of your good fortune, even if you asked him something directly, he would say, oh, I know nothing. I'm completely ignorant. I first heard about Sir Kong Dorje Chung when I was in Baksa. Stories about his suddenly disappearing and reappearing somewhere else and his attendants having to go look for him. Many stories like that. Therefore, soon after we arrived in Nepal and went anxiously to Swayambhanat to meet him, he was staying at a benefactor's house because he didn't have his own monastery at that time and had been kicked out of the monastery where he was staying due to some political problem. It was a Nepalese house and he was staying upstairs. When we arrived, this very simple monk came down the steps and we asked him, where's Sir Kong Dorji Chung? He told us to wait and went back inside through another door, not the one he'd come out of. Then we went upstairs to Rinpoche's room and the simple monk we'd seen downstairs was sitting on the bed. It was Sir Kong Dorje Chung. So a shorter account of this same story, a story that Rinpoche teaches are frequently upon, uh, can be found in Heart of the Path on page 74, the Kindle version. So I just wanted to hone in a little bit here on this capacity to be deeply moved by an encounter with the guru. Kabjai Zopa Rinpoche refers to his encounter on this occasion as like an atomic explosion, a very powerful teaching. So there's something remarkable in this encounter. And I think it's very, very necessary here, uh, particularly perhaps as, as Westerners approaching a classical guru uh, teacher student relationship uh, as a sort of within uh, the Buddhist framework, to accept that there can be extraordinarily magical and mysterious dimensions to this relationship, but also we have a need to ground it very, very clearly in in fact and common sense. So this is a bit there's a bit of tension there, and I think this is why people do potentially struggle with with coming to terms with with what is intended uh, by Guru Yoga. So 
His Holiness uh, Sakya Treason, in his uh, very, very uh, beautiful uh, preface to Rinpoche's book, um, points out three grounds uh, that we need to uh, appreciate in order to understand the significance of a steadfast trust and dedication to the guru. Quote, foremost, there are innumerable quotations from the sutras as well as the chastras, the commentaries, stating that a qualified guru is the source of all the qualities and benefits required to be liberated from the cycle of suffering existence. Secondly, examining through logical reasoning, we ourselves can recognize the truth underlying guru devotion. For example, the sun brightly shines all the time in all the directions, but without necessary instruments, we cannot fully utilize it. We can't harness its tremendous energy. Likewise, the Buddha's, Buddha's blessings are showered down on all sentient beings all the time, but we can't receive them without the presence of a guru because our defilements and our karmic propensities prevents us from seeing the Buddha. Thus, we do not have the fortune of hearing instructions and receiving blessings directly. It is only through the guru, who is in, is in ordinary form like ourselves, that we can hear and see, that we can receive the Buddha's teachings and therefore receive the holy blessings. Lastly, the pith instructions found in the biographies of all the ancient masters tell us that all of those who followed the guru's advice with unshakable faith have attained realizations, and those who failed to do so have not. In the Vajrayana path, the importance of the guru increases many fold as it is the qualified master who, through bestowing the unbroken lineage of empowerments, which can be traced back to the Buddha himself, opens the gateway of the path to the enlightened ones and helps us to realize the actual nature of the mind. So His Holiness, the Sakya Treason, is inviting us to arrive at our own genuine devotion to the Guru, and that is to be actively forged by relying on the authentic scriptural sources. Secondly, we're to rely on logical reasoning in order to touch upon the truth underlying Guru devotion, which is also referring to an understanding of our own Buddha nature and the potential every sentient being without exception to achieve the state of dharmakaya to realize the actual nature of the mind thirdly we need to rely on the pith instructions found in the biographies of the ancient masters and of course um, in relying on the contents of the heart of the path we are doing exactly that because that is what Rinpoche has done he's drawn in from a vast sort of uh, array of teachings to extract the essence uh, that will be the most effective for our minds. But in order to even begin to wish to arrive at such a personal, personal genuine devotion, we need to have determine the reasons why such devotion would be a benefit and what the nature of devotion would mean in this context. As Kabjai Zopa Rinpoche repeatedly stresses throughout the heart of the path, without the guru, there is no enlightenment, at least for the likes of bewildered persons such as ourselves. This is because, left to our own devices, we can't see past ourselves. 
we can't step beyond the kind of immaculate obsessive prescriptions of our self-cherishing egoic mind and this is because it's rooted in the afflictions it is sort of the function of the afflictions in a way and it also is rooted in primordial ignorance grasping at at things in a, a way that is totally out of kilter with, with the way in which they exist so in chapter one uh Rinpoche, towards the end of, of that chapter gives an account of Manjushri's pith instruction to Lama Tsongkhapa. And here you must remember that Lama Tsongkhapa, because of his incredible purity and, and immense, incalculably immense collection of merit, uh, was able to have direct communication with Manjushri. So his, his guru was, personal guru was Manjushri, manifesting and, and pouring out teachings according to Tsongkhapa's needs. So it's very, very inspiring, isn't it, to think about this. So Manjushri advised to train your mind in the actual body of the graduated path to enlightenment. You should attempt to purify your obstacles and accumulate merit, which are the necessary conditions. Then you should make single-pointed requests to the guru inseparable from the deity in order to receive blessings within the heart. If you attempt to strongly and continuously practice in this way every day, realizations will come without difficulty. This is, I think, many, many things we could discuss here, but Mandrushri is inviting Tsongkhapa to open himself out so that he is able to have realizations arising without difficulty due to the power of his guru devotion. And that guru devotion is enabling his purification of negative karma on the mind stream, as well as the capacity to accumulate immense merit. So these two factors, which are the ones that Manjushri has so clearly identified, are absolutely critical in order to accomplish the two wings of the path, method and wisdom, leading to full enlightenment. So this becomes clearer if I, I explain a little bit more in, in Rinpoche's words, of course. Um, I'm only sort of stumbling along here. The guru, says Rinpoche, is the supreme field of merit. The guru is the supreme merit field. Why is the term field used? Because a field is something to depend upon for our survival and enjoyment. We plant seeds in a field, the seeds grow, and then we receive crops. It is similar with the guru. Like planting seeds in a field through doing prostrations, making offerings, making requests, and so forth, we accumulate merit from which we receive all happiness, the happiness of this and the happiness of future lives, liberation from samsara and great liberation or full enlightenment. We receive all of our past, present, and future happiness in, and success independence upon the holy object of the guru. Secondly, this indicates the role of requests. While we are training our mind in meditations on the steps of the path to enlightenment, we need to make strong single-pointed requests to the guru out of guru devotion. Single-pointedly praying with guru devotion causes us to receive the blessings of the guru. So I just want to propose here that this process of, of requesting the guru uh, maps out the kind of terrain of our spiritual practice in a very, very special way. Because on the one hand, we're recognizing our immediate limitations. 
and uh, the fact that we are encumbered with negativities, many of which have been so profoundly impressed on the mind that they arise as compulsions to anger and, and, and so forth. We, we don't seem to have much power over them. They're, they're so strong. Desire, irresistibly powerful, and, and so forth. And likewise, we can't see the nature of reality clearly because we're overlaying it with projections of, of true existence. So by visualizing the guru as the epitome, the fulfillment of the path, inseparable from Shakyamuni Buddha, as we did in the initial visualization, we're lifting ourselves outside, elevating ourselves, if you like, um, into this awareness of the goal. But at the same time, this is the unique quality of practicing guru devotion, we're invoking and channeling that superior energy, because it's completely perfected, completely pure, to come into our realm and do its work, to dissolve away negativities and to fuel our capacity for positive actions. So on the one hand, we do have a guru who's an external object to ourselves. Their mind stream is not our mind stream. And at the same time, in our practice of guru devotion, we're visualizing the guru. And we're invoking the gurus and the Buddhas and all the merit field as we did at the beginning into that singleized, visualized entity. And at the time of the invocation, we feel that they have become absolutely inseparable. So we now have a relationship with our teacher connected by the bond or the path of our concentrated awareness that's actively engaging in, in stabilizing and, and um, working with that visualization. So this gives us um, a technology, we might call it. I mean, Lama Yeshi talked about Tantra as a form of technology, and I think it's a very valuable description because it's a way of working with forces and energies and concepts that is much more expansive and radical than anything our little clumsy egoic mind is capable of. Rinpoche often saying teachings, if we look around to think, well, have I practiced guru devotion in the past or not? We can probably pretty much safely say we haven't done very much at all because the proof is we're not enlightened. This is the, the crunch. We have been the uh, tool of, of the self-cherishing mind and so forth for countless lifetimes. And so this precious human rebirth, we have this glimmer of insight into the possibility of perfection, of, of fulfilling these goals that are way beyond um, our limited focus of me, 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 now, now, now. And we suddenly have this new way of working with it, which is a technology of our mind, but it is also opening out the opportunity of the Buddhas and the gurus to pour their blessings into us. Rinpoche gives the analogy um, in the book of, of, a, of a plant, a flower hidden under a rock. And although the sun is pouring down, that little flower hidden under the rock can't avail itself of the radiant, invigorating energy of the sun. It's been cut off from the contact. So it's not that the Buddhas and the gurus aren't wishing to help continuously, all beings, not just us, but that we can't receive those blessings unless we open the door sufficiently for the light of the sun to pour in. So there's a, I was going to say voluptuous, actually. There's a kind of voluptuous dimension to guru devotion because we are not so much humbled by our tiny little base of existence when we visualize a guru. We're not humiliated to be so ordinary. We're actually uh, invoking the possibility of fulfilling the same path that our, our gurus and the Buddhas have traveled on to become fully enlightened. So we're asking for their help to make this journey and uh, to be as assisted 
in this journey. So I want to just um, focus a little bit more on this idea of, of requesting. And I just want to tell a, a brief personal story. When I first met um, KJ Zopa Rinpoche in, in 1983, um, it was like, a am just saying this in my own little way, uh, an atomic explosion going off as well. And I, I couldn't believe uh, that such a being existed. I was just completely astounded and kind of um, in awe. And I, uh, during the end of that uh, body of teachings at a teacher centre, uh, Rinpoche conferred a 21 Tara initiation to those who wish to receive it and to also immediately go on to do a 21 Tara retreat. So I went from not having had contact with uh, any of the Tibetan lamas to sitting in retreat, all in the space of a matter of days. And when I, this is part of the story I want to concentrate on, when I left the retreat, the one thought in my mind was, how do I preserve this contact, this relationship? Because nothing like that had ever happened to me before. So there was fear, actually, that like so many other things in my life, I'm sure I'm speaking for others, I had taken things up with a good intention. They might have been good things taken up with a good intention, but several weeks, months, years later, they've dwindled away, they've been lost and even forgotten or suppressed. Surely, Ross, you're not going to do this this time, because nothing more powerful and significant had occurred to me in my awareness before. So I, you'll be glad to hear I had a, I had a tactic. I um, decided, because <laughs> I've been visualizing Tara in the retreat, that I would invoke Tara's help to maintain my relationship with Cab Jay Zopa Rinpoche. And also at this retreat, I also met um, Geshe Doga, who's my, my precious teacher and has been continuously my precious teacher since that time. He's based at Tara Institute here in Melbourne. So there's been a continuity there of contact, which is remarkable, given that I'm a Western boy born in an outback mining town with a Western education and so forth. And here I'm having in this incredibly fortunate continuous contact with these remarkable teachers. So anyway, I, I prayed to Tara. So I suddenly developed a prayer uh, practice and that's what I'm calling supplication here. I think there's an incredibly important role for supplication in our practice. We're inviting, we're requesting, we're asking for support and for help in very, very particular ways. And I say particular because we're not trying to say, oh, I'm a really special person, I need to be healed, and therefore I'm going to have a, a guru looking after me so I can become whatever. We're saying, may I also travel the Bodhisattva's path to full enlightenment to benefit others? And in doing so, may I surrender the powerful, tenacious stranglehold of the self-cherishing mind that is directly stopping me from developing a mind that spontaneously cherishes others more than myself. Ordinary ego psychology will not give you the tools to completely flip that mind over. We need remarkable levels of, of inquiry and support. And so part of this sort of technology I was describing involves two the fact that the guru can shock us and shock us out of our complacency, out of the kind of normality, the habitual inertia of the ordinary in which we're saturated in our daily lives. We, we forget that our lives are remarkable, don't we? We forget, we forget that every moment is an opportunity for radical transformation. We forget that every moment is an opportunity to generate love and concern for others. 
And so I want to sort of propose here that supplication becomes a form of lens that enables the guru's uh, energy to enter into our own realm. But it does that in a very special way because it's concerning the great goals of, of full enlightenment. So I just want to take a couple of little steps here. Um, when we go for refuge, of course, we all know that there's um, a kind of a external refuge object that we, we visualize and then go sangha, chodang, so whatever, we, we do our refuge prayers. But if we study the refuge topic in the Lam Rim, we discover that there's also uh, the reality that when we go to refuge to the external refuge object, we're also going for, to refuge to our own resultant, resultant enlightenment. And this is a very, very extraordinary thing to contemplate. Because we do have that capacity and we can take refuge in it. And we can take refuge in it because the path towards it is completely safe and sensible. This is something we need to check. But if we've determined that it's safe and sensible, we can full heartedly uh, open ourselves to refuge. And that one, what I meant with that rather playful use of voluptuous, there's something, oh, just simply allow it to be because it is so wonderful, this relationship. We don't sort of have to um, put into compartments and, and, and fossilize it through sort of conceptual containment. We can simply allow that sense of being open or 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 struck but we also need to be sensible so we need to check that we have a wise and compassionate guide one who will not abandon us at any juncture due to their unconditioned unconditional love not just for ourselves but for all beings so um, I'll just tell a story. This, this um, recently, um, we did a, a Lama Chopa for the uh, Sakadawa, and Geshe Dogo was just making some comments at the beginning of the practice, how he'd been approached. He told a story about how he'd been approached by some uh, people while he was uh, in a country town in Victoria, and the man had had observed Geshe Dogo praying, doing prayers, ritual prayers. And he'd come up to Geshe Dogen and said, who are you praying to if you don't believe in a creator God? Who's out there? And Geshe Doga told us as the students sitting there at the Lama Chopa that that is actually a very difficult question to answer simply and particularly to answer to someone who perhaps not uh, aware of the full structure of, of the the Buddha's presentation. So Geshe Doga said we must think deeply about this question and what it might mean. So here I wanted to uh, introduce um, a very uh, vivid um, visualization structure, if you like, um, which is connected to a prayer to sort of uh, represent. Um, the importance of supplication or requesting. So um, this requesting prayer uh, is found in the Jorcho presentation, which is referring to the preliminary practices of the Lum Rim. But when we say the preliminary practices, we do not, don't mean that we just do them at the beginning and then we forget about them. It just means that all of our practices open up on the basis of these essential initial criteria, if you like. And so this kind of requesting prayer, uh, because it's so um, special and powerful, is given the name planting the stake. And it's planting the stake in the same way that we stake the peg of a tent. Every time we bang the peg, the peg becomes more grounded, less able to fall over or be removed by a gust of wind. And so we're being in, asked to uh, consolidate 
our relationship with the guru, this is getting back to the idea I didn't want to lose it, with requesting in order to plant the stake of that relationship at a deep, deep karmic level. And so if we're sort of looking at, at a classical presentation of this prayer, we would um, visualize the objects of refuge. We would take refuge and generate bodhicitta. These are all the practices we're very familiar with. We'd uh, generate the four immeasurable thoughts. And Rinpoche says we'd also, looking at this in the context of Giorgio preliminaries, we'd also offer the bath to the holy objects. And we would make requesting prayers to the lineage Lamrim lineage gurus, and then we would request planting, I'm um, doing the requesting prayer, planting the stake. And so this prayer can be found um, on page 161, what, 69 to 71 of the FPMT retreat prayer book. And in that translation, Shakyamuni Buddha is referred to as Tukwang Dorji Chang. However, I'm going to present um, the excellent meditation account given by Gume Kensa Lobsang Jampa in the Easy Path, illuminating the Panchen Lama's secret instructions. And this is apropos because um, the Panchen Lama wrote both the Guru Puja and um, the easy path. So we've got this kind of um, common authorship here. So Gume Kensa Lobsang Jumper says, before reciting this prayer, I'm going to ask us to do this now in the form of a visualization. Visualize, and we've still got the visualization here, visualize light rays radiating out from the hum syllable these lights causes all the lineage masters of the profound view to dissolve into Manjushri, those of the lineage of extensive deeds to dissolve into Maitreya, those of Tantra to dissolve into Vajradhara, Shakyamuni Buddha, inseparable in essence from the root guru, comes and sits on our crown. And he's a three-tiered being, Shakyamuni Buddha, with Vajradhara at his heart, who himself has a hung syllable at his heart. Focusing on your root guru in this form atop your head, we can do uh, a seven-limb prayer, a short mandala, and then this prayer, planting the stake. So I'm just going to recite the seven-limb prayer in English. I'll so I feel that we're doing the prayer together. I prostrate with body, speech, and mind in faith. Each and every offering I make, including those really performed and those mentally transformed. I confess every sin collected from the beginninglessness of samsaric life. I rejoice in all ordinary and noble beings' actions. Please, Buddha, by living as our guide until samsara ends, reveal the teachings to sentient beings. I dedicate the virtue of myself and others to the great enlightenment. And then we'll do the, uh, just the outer mandala. By the virtue of offering to you assembly of Buddhas, visualize before me, this mandala built on a base resplendent with flowers, saffron water, and incense, adorned with Mount Meru and the four continents, as well as the sun and the moon, may all sentient beings share in its good effects. And so now, feel very strongly uh, that we're sharing in the, the recitation of, of the prayer planting the stake, which is um, in this case drawn from the easy path of the Pachin Lama. Embodiment, and we're appealing directly to our Guru. Embodiment of the four bodies, Guru, Supreme Deity, 
to Shakamuni Vajradhara and make requests. Embodiment of the truth body, free of obscuration, supreme guru deity, to Shakamuni Vajradhara and make requests. Embodiment of the great bliss enjoyment body, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of the various emanation bodies, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all gurus, Guru Supreme Deity. To Shakamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all meditational deities, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Buddhas, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all holy Dharma, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Sangha, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Dakinis, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Dharma protectors, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Unity of all objects of refuge, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Now feeling from the very depths of our heart. All mother sentient beings and I have been born in samsara and have endured a host of intense sufferings over a long time. This is a result of not having relied properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deed. Therefore, Guru Deity, bless me and all mother sentient beings to now rely properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deed. So the last line, um, unity of all objects of refuge, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajra, I make requests. This is really uh, very, very important indeed, because formally in the prayer, we've enumerated the qualities of the Guru's embodiment, what they're manifesting, if you like, what they're representing uh, as individual characteristics. But in this line, we're saying the unity of all objects of refuge is the Guru. So everything all the positive qualities have been gathered into this one indissolvably without any fracture or gap this is this is incredibly important because if we hold, can hold this feeling and then invoke as we're going to do in the next step of the meditation the absorption of light rays and nectar we're opening a, a conduit, if you like, to receiving those blessings at the very, in the very depths of our heart, which is also, of course, from a tantric perspective, referring to our most subtle body and mind and our capacity to generate the illusory body and, and the clear light, meaning clear, the perfect clear light minds that will become the causes of the arising of the form and uh, sort of Dharmakaya bodies of, of the Buddha. So with this supplications, with this known visualization, 
streams of five colored nectars together with rays of light descend from the body of the guru deity upon our crown. And at the same time, these streams of light and nectar enter the bodies and minds of all sentient beings. And they and ourselves are thereby purified of all misdeeds and obstructions accumulated from beginningless time. In particular, they purify all the misdeeds, obscurations, sicknesses and spirit possessions that prevent the ability to depend properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deeds. So as we're absorbing in this way, uh, our and others' bodies transform into the nature of pristine, luminous light. All our and others' good qualities, such as a long lifespan and accumulated accumulation of vast merit, is increased and exponentially expanded. In particular, think that these streams have produced in the minds of ourselves and all others the special realization that enables you to rely properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deed. So I just a little, a little sort of a intract here. This is uh, why I think, of course, um, Geshe Doga has, has recommended that uh, as we're on the, the threshold of, of death, to think of his holiness the Dalai Lama. This is really, and then to feel that all of that energy enters into us. And with that, we let go and we die with His Holiness's blessings. In um, India, during the uh, anniversary celebrations for Lama Tsongkhapa a couple of years ago, um, his whole, I was, had the fortune of being there along with many thousands of others. And uh, His Holiness had sort of come into the, the auditorium, which was the debate, repurposed debate hall. And he'd spent a considerable amount of time greeting and speaking with incredibly old and frail Tibetans who had, had gathered at the uh, sort of on the, the pathway of the entrance into the hall. And it was incredibly moving to see not just his holiness's care for the, these old and very devout people, of course, but what it meant to them to have his holiness hold their hands with such force and to touch their heads and to also touch their foreheads with his forehead as a blessing. That was the pinnacle of their life and they could happily die from that point and that's why they were there so you know, that's one thing but during his introduction to, to his talk his holiness opened that right out and said i will be there for all of you as your guide at the time of death and how can i ever forget something like that how remarkable and it wasn't just for those who were there when his holiness says something like that he, he, he's referring to, to everyone so uh, Gume Kensa Lobsang Jumper um, points out that this prayer, planting the stake, is very similar to uh, the prayer that we find in the Guru Puja, which I'll, I'll quote. You are my guru, you are my deities, you are the Dakinis and Dharma protectors. From this moment until enlightenment, I need to seek no refuge other than you. In this life, the bardo and all future lives, hold me with the hook, your hook of compassion, free me from samsara and nirvana's fears, grant all attainments, 
be my unfailing friend and guard me from interferences. So I'll read that. It's read three times in the, in the practice, but I'll read it again. You are my guru. You are my deities. You are the Dakinis and Dharma protectors. From this moment until enlightenment, I need seek no refuge other than you. In this life, the bardo, and all future lives, hold me with your hook of compassion. Free me from samsara and nirvana spheres. Grant all attainments. Be my unfailing friend and guard me from interferences. So we'll recite it the third time at the end of, of the session. But um, as Gurmay Kensa Bob Singh Jumper indicates, uh, this prayer uh, emanates or is, is sourced uh, from what is known as the Tushita emanation scripture, which was not made of paper and ink. It was received by Lama Tsongkhapa from Manjushri and then passed down from master to disciples by highly realized masters of the Gandan oral tradition. Panchen Loseng Cherki Geltsen was the first master, oh. same author, to write these uh, verses down in, in material form at this point, and um, so that we can now use them in our practice. So this is really the quintessential essence of, of, of devotion in the context of, of Guru Yoga. So in summary, it's only through planting the stake of devotion that realizations of the path can arise. And its importance, therefore, is also in powerfully emphasized by lamas in all the other Tibetan traditions. For example, Kagyu Drupak uh, Shakya Shri in his pith instruction, opening the door to emancipation, says, I've got a quote, from beginning to end, the things connected with this, experiences arising or not, actually being realized or not, obstructions, obstructors and points of deviation being present or not, and so on, happen only in dependence on devotion to the guru. So there is, even for this lowly old man, nothing to do but supplicate the guru. It is only through planting the stake of devotion that just a little of the guru's kind realization has arisen in my mind stream. Practitioners of the future too will cherish supplicating the guru because if they do make efforts at guru devotion, they'll find that it brings them the profound key. Even if you do not realize the face of mind, if you do not do the enhancing practices, realization will not leap higher. So this enhancement is an exceptionally important point. Thus, given that the supreme enhancer is guru devotion, meditate on the guru on, at your crown, supplicate like planting a stake, and meditate assiduously while his mind and yours have not merged. So we meditate while they've merged. When the absorption occurs we also meditate on their merging and this of course is a very very uh special uh moment in our meditational practice so briefly all obstacle removal enhancement comes about through devotion and supplication to the guru thus keeping the guru in mind remembering him and thinking that there is nothing except for him with eyes always wet from tears pouring down at all times and in all circumstances, persevere at supplicating him. I'm using the 
male pronoun. It need not be a male guru. So this is getting back to my praising continuously, at least I'm um, praying continuously to Tara when I left uh, the retreat in Bendigo because this is something I could do. So I remember I caught a bus uh, to my uh, where I was living in, in Abbotsford. It was one of those incredibly hot Melbourne summer days. And so it was like sitting inside an oven in the bus in a very, very congested street. And I'd made my way from, from the station. So I was, you know, sort of in shock after the retreat of sort of having to re-navigate the world that I'd left before the retreat. And there was a florist shop full of flowers. I could see through the window. And so I, I'm not boasting here. I'm just explaining what I'd been taught on the retreat and by, by my teachers, Keshi Doga and so forth. I offered the flowers, the beauty of the flowers, um, to Tara and supplicated her uh, to consolidate my bond with my holy teacher. In fact, I saw Tara as indistinguishable from my holy, holy teacher. And uh, so when we, at, in all, at all occasions, means that as we're going out and about, we're practicing guru yoga. We don't just do it when we're sitting on our cushion trying to develop a special state of mind. It's a way of weaving our practice in a very, very subtle way into the very fabric of our ordinary appearances so that they start to shift and, and uh, we start to gain some momentum for transformation outside the stranglehold of the ego, as I was mentioning before. So, all very well, Ross, you've set up a, a very um, evocative picture here. But the question still remains, how do we choose a spiritual guru to whom we can wholeheartedly devote ourselves? And so we're now going to look at this because it's, you know, it is such an important question. And it's, it's a topic that um, Kabjai Zopa Rinpoche deals with um, extensively in Chapter 4 of the book and starting on page um, 29. So in Rinpoche's account, which follows the classic Lam Rim presentation, he precisely delineates the qualities of the guru that we should expect in terms of the critical set of qualities empowering us to happily and formally embrace a karmic, a close karmic relationship without fear or doubt. Uh, but before moving to this, I would like to refer to the manner in which His Holiness with Tukton Chodron uh, as co-author so carefully prefaces this question and it comes in the form of the investigation of a person's qualities. And so we're being invited, in other words, to investigate the qualities of the guru prior to forming a committed relationship. So His Holiness um, evokes this idea with, with, with a metaphor of a pilot. He says, if like a spiritual mentor, the pilot of a plane is not well trained, traveling with him or her is risky. To help disciples assess the training of a potential spiritual mentor, the Buddha explained the qualities of the various types of spiritual teachers. Students, this is talking to us here, students are responsible for evaluating the qualifications of prospective teachers and choosing with whom they wish, they wish to form a mentor disciple relationship is only us extending that idea sakya pandita commented that all people people are very careful and diligently test the purity of jewels before purchasing them examining spiritual mentors and teachings 
is even more important than checking the quality of jewels since we are seeking the truth that will lead us to lasting happiness. We should not run after spiritual mentors like dogs gobbling up meat. Instead of being pressed by titles and elaborate thrones, we must seek spiritual mentors who are learned and practice well. Some people are naive and easily misled by charismatic teachers who claim to be spiritually realized. And His Holiness now enforces that point. In the West, he says, this may happen because Buddhism is new and people do not know the qualities to look for in good teachers. Difficulties arise in Asia too. Some years ago, a person from mainland China came to see me and said that a false Lama, these Hollandish words here, a false Lama from Tibet had gone to China and claimed to be a Dharma king, but was actually seeking money and sex. Blind to his true motivation, some Chinese were devoted to him. Similar things have happened in Mongolia as well. Now, Kabje Zopa Rinpoche is similarly concerned that we don't just step into this relationship casually, carelessly, or even disastrously. So on page 42, 43 of the Kindle edition of The Heart of the Path, Rinpoche says, we shouldn't rely upon just anyone as a guru. In order to achieve the goal of enlightenment for the sake of other sentient beings, we should have a virtuous teacher who is able to show us the complete infallible path to enlightenment. As mentioned in the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, the guru should be someone who understands the whole instruction and can lead us in the paths of the Hinayana, Paramitayana and Vajrayana. As Manjushri advised, for the disciple to become enlightened in one brief lifetime of this degenerate time, the Lama should be someone who is able to lead the disciple in the complete path. It is like pulling on a dingwa, the square sangha cover sheet, a seat cover. We see you know, the monks and the nuns lay down a, a dingwa before uh, taking their seat. So he says, it is like pulling on a dingwa. No matter which side you pull, the whole dingwa comes. In a similar way, all the teachings of the Hinayana, Paramitayana, and Vajrayana are related to one another and are instructions for one person's graduated path to achieve enlightenment. Nothing is left out. So Rinpoche continues, I'll, I'll continue as well. In the great treatise, Lama Tsongkhapa also emphasizes that we shouldn't give the label realization to just any kind of achievement. For example, someone might have done some meditation practice and achieved clairvoyance or some miraculous power to heal sickness or bring wealth. But referring to the qualities of guru here, if that person hasn't meditated on the Lamrim, the main road to enlightenment, and gained any realization of guru devotion, renunciation, bodhicitta, emptiness, the five Mahayana paths, and ten Bhumis, or the two tantric stages, then those other attainments can't be called realizations. Of course, any ordinary people who don't know about Dharma, who don't know about the Four Noble Truths, regard someone who has clairvoyance and can tell them about the past and the future as very special, more special than someone who doesn't have that psychic power. 
but can show them the Four Noble Truths. If we don't really understand or have faith in the Four Noble Truths, you have no appreciation of someone who actually can liberate you from the oceans of samsaric suffering and its cause, karma and delusions. We feel that someone with clairvoyance or miraculous powers is much more special than the person who, is re who really is awakening us from ignorance and liberating us through teaching us about the Four Noble Truths, about how to free from the suffering of samsara and its cause. We don't feel that this person who is not only liberating us from samsara, but bringing us to enlightenment by teaching us about the Lum Rim, the five Mahayana paths and 10 Bhumis or the tantric paths is special. We feel such a person is kind of ordinary. Thinking in this way is wrong. Why? Because we have had such miraculous powers numerous times, but we're still in samsara. And we have achieved single-pointed concentration numberless times, so that if we placed our mind on an object, it could stay there like a mountain for years or eons. As Kadampa Geshe Chengawa said, we have had all these powers numberless times, but they didn't bring us any special benefit and we're still in samsara. Leave aside practicing and realizing Lam Rim, I would prefer even to ask questions about what the Lam Rim is or means to having such powers. So this is very, very pertinent um, to us. And it's particularly pertinent to those of us wishing to forge a new relationship with a guru, because it's necessary, as His Holiness has mentioned, that we don't make a kind of error of judgment and embrace what we might call, as His Holiness has, a false lama or a false guru. And the stakes can be very high here, and the um, attractions to a false guru can be very uh, compelling, very exotic and uh, very effective. So I just want to mention here that uh, we're dealing with cults. And I just wanted to refer to the um, Japanese Om Shinriko terrorist cult, which orchestrated, as we can remember, the deadly Sarin Tokyo subway attacks in 1995. It advertised itself and appealed to its followers with a heady, syncretic fusion of spiritual beliefs that its charismatic leader Asahara drew from Hindu, early Indian Buddhist, Japanese Pure Land and Tibetan sources together with Christian apocalyptic fantasies, the prophecies of Nostradamus, etc., etc., Moreover, that wasn't a heady enough mix. Yoga and meditation or practice were staples of their spiritual program, as were the claims of its leaders, including Asahara himself, to be gentle, quiet, ascetic, and to be living the life of a renounced mystic. So uh, just to add a little bit to that story, the cult theorist Robert J. Lifton believes that Asahara, quote, interpreted the Tibetan Buddhist concept of power in order to claim that by killing someone contrary to the group's aims, an enemy of the group, they were preventing that person from accumulating bad karma and thus saving them. So you can see how twisted this kind of uh, erroneous mentality of the false guru can be. Here, the idea of uh, sort of uh, evicting the mind, the subtle mind at the time of death <coughs> through the power of yogic practice, which is uh, a 
talked about within the Tibetan tantric frameworks um, is being misconstrued, in fact, poisoned to mean that I can kill someone else and because their mind will leave their body, because I'm a, a mystic, I can then guide them to a state of freedom at that moment. So I haven't actually murdered anyone at all. I've liberated them. That's toxic thinking. And it was to literally toxic. They developed sarin gas that they released in a subway. People there didn't have any choice but to breathe that poisoned air. And so consequently, uh, they died. So this is an incredible but sharply focused perversion of a Buddhist concept put towards the most malevolent ends, such as the strategic uh, assassination of those who might criticize or threaten to break away from the cult. So we can find many other examples of, of recruitment um, in this way, some unfortunately closer to home. Um, and I'm just, not just, but I'm, I'm just mentioning here um, situations where female Buddhist students are chosen uh, as sexual consorts by predatory gurus operating behind the cover of advanced tantric practice. So it's not my purpose to detail such accounts here, but clearly when His Holiness asks us not to be naive, this is his word, naive, these are the sorts of real life situations and predicaments that, uh, of which we must be aware. So His Holiness is very, very specific on this point to do with a misuse, particularly of tantric um, precepts and practice. He says, tantric precepts govern this practice meaning there's a container for them, and practitioners must adhere to them. Tantra is a higher practice, which implies that a person who takes tantric ethical restraints has sufficient control over his or her body, speech and mind to keep the Vinaya ethics and the Bodhisattva ethical restraints, which are comparatively easier to keep. People who find it difficult to observe the five lay precepts are not suitable vessels for tantric practices because they lack the restraint needed to fulfill the tantric precepts and pledges. It may happen that an unmarried teacher meets an unmarried student. If the relationship develops in a normal way with mutual agreement and respect and they decide to marry, it is fine. These two people treat each other equally, and so there is no difference in power or status when deciding to have sexual relations. That person is not on a throne then. However, if the teacher is with one student one month and another the next, that is not right. Coercing or forcing sexual contact is wrong. Teachers should not manipulate a teacher into having a sexual relationship with them by saying she, so she has the signs of being a dakini or has great dharma potential or that having sex with him is a special blessing. Some people who have been sexually abused by Buddhist teachers give up their faith and respect for the Buddha. This makes me very sad. So, so that's the end of that quote. And um, th this had a, a personal resonance for me because um, one of the members of my, my family, a sibling, had uh, developed a strong interest in a particular Tibetan Buddhist lineage and was regularly meditating and going on retreats and so forth. And when this particular lama was... Um, exposed, if you like, as uh, having had inappropriate uh, sexual relationships, coercive sexual relationships with, with uh, students, uh, was completely, my, my sibling was completely devastated. And 
she'd had a strong feminist background, she has a strong feminist background, a strong feminist outlook, and she couldn't reconcile what she was discovering this teacher had had done. I probably have to say professedly done for legal reasons because people get sued for talking about these things. Um, she she couldn't unravel it. And so for her, the only way to work forward was to give up her practice. And so that's what His Holiness is referring to as something making him very sad. That's the power of, of that um, relationship going wrong. So uh, His Holiness advises every Buddhist centre could make it available, the requirements for the various levels of teachers and instruct people how to select teachers. As I've always, as I always emphasize, in the beginning, one should consider the person explaining the Dharma, not as a guru, but as a Dharma friend. After a year or two, when both people know each other well, the student may develop the conviction that this person is reliable and entrust this teacher to be their guru. Then their relationship becomes one of guru disciple. Many of the problems Buddhism is currently facing in the West have, has arisen, says His Holiness, because this is an early stage of the transmission of the Dharma to Western countries. And there is the opportunity for charlatans and unqualified people to teach. However, as Buddhism becomes more rooted in the culture and people understand it better, they will know how to judge the teacher's qualities and will protect themselves. This is a part of a natural process as Dharma takes root. So, uh, Oh, now uh, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to refer now to um, Kabje Soparimpache's advice. On page 44, Kindle edition, Heart of the Path. Lama Tsongkhapa also stresses that the virtuous friend and his way of subduing our mind should be in accord with the general teaching of Buddha. The virtuous friend should be qualified and able to lead the disciple in the steps of the path, not only to liberation, but enlightenment. As a Mahayana practitioner, he or she should be in harmony with the general teaching of the Buddha and have subdued their mind in that way so that they might help their disciples to actualize the whole path. So I'll, I'll finish the presentation there. Ne next week, uh, time is going very quickly. I've only got four sessions. I'm going to uh, deal with um, Kabje Zopirubashe's classic enumeration of the qualifications of the guru. And then in the last part of the session, I'm going to jump across to the very much related topic of the characteristics of the student so in this way um, i'm hoping that we've sort of got some ground established uh, on which to do our own personal study and investigation because there are excellent resources available on this topic and my job here is not to cover all those topics but simply to i think provide a little setting for beginning to consider investigating so um, we'll conclude this session, but we might just spend a moment just uh, recollecting our thoughts again. And recollecting the visualization on our crown, just make any personal 
supplications. And here we're seeing the Holy Guru as the same entity as the Buddha. The Buddha entirely shorn of any faults and imbued with the complete fulfillment of all positive qualities. This is a perfect, reliable, safe refuge object. So make any supplications we might have. And then visualize the guru coming down. We can send a replica or we can absorb the actual visualization itself, depending on whether we're going to be doing more practice in the day. Bring the energy down into the heart where we have a multicolored lotus sun and moon disc waiting. And as this happens, feel that we become indistinguishable from the radiant, enlightened energy of the holy beings. We dedicate the merits. May I quickly become Guru Lord Buddha and lead each and every sentient being into his enlightened realm because of these merits. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may they, that which has arisen never diminish but increase forevermore. May my venerable lama's life be firm, his white divine actions spread in the ten directions, and the torch of Lo Sang's teachings always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. I just thought to mention before going that uh, I'm going to take the advantage of next week's class to read some uh, incredibly moving extracts from Lama Asongkhapa's uh, exquisitely poetic prose poem to Sara Paradita, who was a highly realized bodhisattva seeking his guru to teach him uh, the wisdom of emptiness. And so I'll, I'll uh, take advantage of, of the opportunity because this is a very rare book. In fact, I can't find it anywhere on the, on the web. I bought it on a little tiny stall outside Sarnath University a number of years ago when His Holiness was giving teachings on Shanti Deva's Guide to Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And so the Tibetans have their little stalls there and lots of things on them. And there's always a wonderful little collection of, of books, often slightly dust covered because of the the streetscape and this was sitting there and it's it's a beautifully rendered translation with the tibetan text as well so this story is extracted from the perfection of wisdom sutras and it's also referred to uh by lam lam i'm sorry kabjay sofa rinpoche as well as i'm saying all the lamas so there are multiple references as well. So this really epitomizes the relationship of the student to the teacher. So we're sort of moving over to that other focus. So I hope to have time. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'll, I'll see you again. Take care. Bye-bye.